In 2017, the Ludum Science Center in Quintana made headway in solving a 300-year-old mystery. They started decoding a letter, a letter that was so scandalous, it has now become known as the Devil's Letter. The Ludum Science Center decided that in order to understand the letter better, they needed to observe the mental health of the nun who wrote the letter, even though she lived in the 17th century. For me, I agree. In order to understand this letter, we have to understand the woman who wrote the letter. However, her mental health is not my concern. What stood out to me was her family. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, a very special thank you to all of our producers and to our patrons. Without your financial support, this channel could not continue. We are incredibly grateful to you. If you are a producer on this channel and you have not sent me your business information or any product or any social media page that you want me to advertise on this channel, then please do so. My email address is down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce and today on part one, we are going to be talking about the devil's family. first stumbled upon this story, it reminded me a lot of the Voynich Manuscript and the Codus Gingus, two interesting stories that we have covered on this channel. Both of these stories involved written pieces that not many people could translate. The Codus Gingus is assumed to be the Devil's Bible, and the Voynich Manuscript does still seem to be a little mysterious in its cryptic writing. When I stumbled upon this story about this supposed letter written by a possessed nun, I thought it would be a quick, fun story we could cover on a Friday. However, as I started to dig deeper, I realized there is a lot more to this story than meets the eye. Now, a lot of the connections that I have made are purely speculative on my part, given what we know about bloodline families. I also was shocked to find that dear old Constantine the Great, the man who truly manipulated the Christian religion, plays a part in this story from the 17th century. And I do find it very interesting that in order for the Ludwin Science Center to translate this mysterious letter, they had to go onto the dark web. On the dark web, they were able to access a decryption program that allegedly is available to governments all over the world to be able to decode certain messages. Now, I'm a person that believes our government should be completely transparent with its people. After all, especially here in the United States of America, the people run the government. They work for us. Why are certain decryption programs only available on the dark web? with all the other nefarious activities that happen on the dark web. Isabella Tomasi was born on the 29th of May in 1645. She was born to an extremely wealthy and noble family in Sicily. She was the daughter of a duke, and apparently her family raised their children in a very, very strict Catholic home. In fact, the Tomasi family was so wealthy and so influential in Sicily that they were feudal landlords. And they are the people who gave the land and the money to be able to build the monastery that Isabella Tomasi would become a part of at 15 years old. By the time of Isabella's birth in the 17th century, the Tomasi family was already a well-known noble family with a long lineage and pedigree. The Tomasi family goes back all the way to the Byzantine Empire. 
In fact, on some accounts, it can be traced back to 330 AD. Now, there's lots of stories out there about the Tomasi family, legends of emperors and kings and queens. But the most famous story, the most notorious story of the start of this family's bloodline comes from Emperor Constantine the Great himself. Now again, we have done a video talking about Constantine the Great. The history books will tell you that Constantine is the reason why Christianity sprouted all over the Roman Empire. Well, we know now that that is not true. We know that Constantine himself was a Canaanite. He was Mithraic, and he only utilized the Christian faith in order to manipulate soldiers or peasant class soldiers to join him in his takeover of the Roman Empire. Because before Constantine the Great was the emperor, the Roman Empire ran more like a republic with different territories. But good old Constantine wanted his own little new world order. And so just like the Canaanites we have ruling our world today, Constantine manipulated the vulnerable Christians of the Roman Empire. Constantine's brutality was known in that time period, and many historians from that time period wrote about his notorious violence and corruptible treatment of a people. But if you're on this channel, you do know that starting from the very beginning of the organized Christian church, there has been infiltration from people who worship Moloch, Baal, and Lucifer himself. Wherever there's corruption, the Vatican is sure to be there. Flavius Julius Crispus was Constantine the Great's firstborn son. Crispus' mother was a woman named Minervina. Now, historians argue whether she was actually Constantine's wife or if she was just a concubine. But nonetheless, Crispus was born somewhere in the beginning of the 4th century. By 320 AD, Crispus was given control of the military powers of Gaul from his father, Constantine. Now, Gaul, of course, is France. Constantine's son, Crispus, was a huge reason why Constantine became the emperor and the ruler of the whole Roman Empire. It seems that his son, Crispus, had a lot of talent when it came to war. In 321 AD, Crispus married a woman named Elena, and together they had a son. The story goes that this son's name was Lincino Lepardo. Now, I'm going to note this because the leopard is on the family crest of the Tomases and will come into play later on in our story. Now, just to show you how brutal Constantine was, in 326 AD, Constantine had his son Crispus executed. This is because there was some rumors that Crispus and Constantine's second wife, Faustus, were having an affair. Now, I will say that Faustus herself was also executed by Constantine. And it would be some years later that Constantine would learn that the rumor of this alleged affair was just that, a rumor. But nonetheless, this psychopathic Canaanite that the church has sainted murdered his own son. So the Tomasi family allegedly wants to start their lineage with Crispus' son, Lencino Leparde. Now this line, this Tomasi line, the line of the leopard, stayed in the area of the Byzantine Empire until the 7th century. Allegedly, between the years 640 and 646 AD, two twin brothers who were the head of this lineage fled Constantinople to the island of Sicily. Their names were Artinimo and Gustano. Now, they had to flee from Constantinople because of the death of the emperor Heraclius. At this point, they allegedly feared for their lives due to political struggle among the elite. Seems like there's always political struggle among the elite. So since Constantine the Great, this family has been in a position of unlimited power. 
And this nobility and this power did not change at all when the two twin brothers came to Sicily. Because you see, in Sicily, they did not practice Silic law. We've talked about this law before, especially with our series on the French noble family. This was a law that made sure that the family title, the family bloodline, would pass down through sons. But in Sicily, it also was able to pass down through the daughters. So by the time Isabella Tomasi was born in 1645, her family had been ranking up power and greed and corruption for over a thousand years. On the 7th of October, 1660, Isabella and her sisters Francesca and Antonia entered the convent that their family had built. They were there to take on their new lives as nuns. Now, many people speculate that the daughters were kind of forced into this position. And yes, I am aware that amongst a lot of elite and noble families in Europe during this time, it was customary for at least one kid to join the priesthood or to become a nun. But I can only imagine the alleged ritualistic ABUSC and practices that had happened in this family long before the girls went to the convent. Upon entering the convent, Isabella Tomasi had to take on a new name. Now, I obviously am not Italian and I am not Catholic, and I'm going to do my best to say the full name that Isabella Tomasi took on, but please forgive me if it is not said correctly. This was the name Maria Crafisaia della Conzione, but just to keep it simple, we're going to keep calling her Isabella. Upon entering the convent, the bishop became so impressed by Isabella's devotion and commitment to her new life that he sent three Jesuit priests to inspect her. Now, there's not a whole lot about what happened in this inspection, and in that time, that would have been seen as a great honor. However, <laughs> we know now that if you're visited by the Jesuits, it might not be a good thing. So who only knows what happened in that meeting? Soon, Isabella's behavior started to become erratic. Anytime she got near the altar or any type of holy relic, she would start to faint or pass out or scream. It was almost like you could see the beginnings of a possession. Isabella herself also claimed that the devil was trying to get her to serve him and not Jesus. One morning in August of 1676, when Isabella was 31 years old, she woke up with ink all over her face. Beside her was a letter, a letter that had been penned by Isabella herself, but made no sense to anyone. The letter consisted of ancient Greek, Arabic, runic, and some Latin. There were also mysterious symbols on the letter. Isabella claimed that a group of demons had come into her cell that night and persuaded her to write this letter. This was a letter allegedly from the devil. Isabella quickly showed the letter to her fellow nuns. She claimed that she did understand what the letter said, but would not speak it because it was so terrible. The letter was displayed in the abbey as a warning. And in the Abbey, it stayed until the Woodwind Science Center in 2017 started to finally decode it. Now, the Abbess Maria, who was there during the time of Isabella's life, claimed in her written journals that Isabella did have sporadic episodes. She said that Isabella was always being taunted and attacked by demons. And according to what the Woodwind Science Center has depicted so far, this letter is very, very dark. Now, they've only been able to get through about 14 lines of it, and the gist of this letter says, allegedly, that the devil claimed that Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, had no power on earth, and that God is silly to think that his grace could free mortal souls. The devil claims that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are all quote-unquote deadweights, 
which seems pretty modern slang to me. And again, before anybody goes crazy in the comment section, these are not my words. These are the words that allegedly are coming from this letter for this story. This is not what I believe. Don't shoot the messenger. The letter also claimed that Styx is certain. Styx, spelled just like the band Styx, which is a river, one of the five rivers of the underworld that allegedly separate the living from the dead. Now, the Ludwin Science Center believes that Isabella Tomasi was probably very well educated before she came to the convent at 15 years old. I would agree with this. Again, she came from a very powerful, noble family. They believe that Isabella Tomasi had a command of languages and probably understood a lot of the ancient alphabets. They also believe that she had started to kind of create her own language with these ancient alphabets. And they also believe that Isabella Tomasi probably was either schizophrenic or had a very strong case of bipolar disorder. Now, of course, in the 17th century, there was no cures for these mental illnesses. And it's interesting because I have watched an exorcist speak before where he claimed that even in today, even in our modern society, when someone comes to him wanting an exorcism, they first have to go through a psychological evaluation. Because if the person is schizophrenic or has any other mental disabilities, then they will not perform an exorcism because then doing an exorcism on somebody with mental disabilities could hurt that person person more. That it actually takes a lot for a human being to be legitimately possessed. Now, Isabella could very well have had some mental disabilities. I'm not totally poo-pooing that. However, when it comes to mental disorders, there's still an argument. Is it nurture or is it nature or is it a combination of both? In my opinion, Isabella Tomasi came from a very, very possibly, allegedly, again, in my opinion, diabolical family. Now we know what these family members do to their children, allegedly. And so did Isabella Tomasi develop a mental disability because of certain things that had happened to her in her young life? We know that disassociation is a huge, huge side effect of things like MKUltra mind control. We also know that there was a very mysterious meeting between Isabella and Jesuit priests. Or was Isabella Tomasi legitimately possessed by demons due to her family? and possibly due to practices that she had been involved in. Now again, this is just speculation on my part. If Isabella Tomasi had not come from such a prominent family, I probably would not have given her family a second thought. And the minute I found out that they were descendants, allegedly, of Constantine, I pretty much figured that there was more to this story. And perhaps there are elements to this story we will never know. A man named Giuseppe Tomasi went and visited this monastery in 1955. He wanted to view the letter and see where one of his distant relatives, Isabella Tomasi, lived and died. Isabella Tomasi had died relatively young in her 40s in 1699. It is said that Giuseppe Tomasi was very disturbed by Isabella Tomasi, his very distant relative. Now, Giuseppe Tomasi was born on the 23rd of December in 1896. He was known in his life for being, again, a nobleman, because he is a Tomasi, as well as a writer. From 1954 up until his death in 1957, Giuseppe Tomasi wrote a novel that was called The Leopard. Yes, again, The Leopard going all the way back to the origins of the Tomasi family. This novel would not be published until after Giuseppe's death in 1958. It is now considered one of the greatest novels of all Italian writers. And in 1963, they released a three-hour movie 
based on this book. And I tell you, yesterday, I sat through that three hour movie. I will place a link to that movie in the description box below. Now the link that I am placing in the description box is to a free version of this movie. You can put on the English subtitles. It is obviously done in Italian. However, this link doesn't give the best subtitles. So if you want to watch The Leopard with better subtitles, then you just Google it on YouTube and you can rent it for like $4. I ended up renting it because I really wanted to get a gist of what this story was about. People had said that Giuseppe Tomasi wanted to write a historical novel based on the realities of growing up in an elite family in Sicily. Now, when I was researching this story, a lot of other content creators who covered this story claimed that there was no connection between the novel and Isabella Tomasi's story. However, I beg to differ. And that's because, like you watching, I know that there are certain things that we have not been privy to until, you know, The Great Awakening. And I think the fictional story based on a historical accuracy on the elite family of the Tomasis in Sicily has a lot to do with the circumstances around Isabella Tomasi's story herself. You see, the story of the leopard follows this family living in the 19th century on the island of Sicily. They are a noble family. The lead character himself is a prince. Around this time, Italy was going through somewhat of a revolution and a war breaks out. Now again, our main character is living a very noble and privileged life. During this revolution, we see the rise of the middle class. Now in some instances, some of the middle class people are probably worth more than the ancient and noble people. The big difference is the ancient noble people are born into their privilege where the middle class has worked for theirs. Well, the main character's nephew goes off to fight in the war. In the story, the main character's nephew has a bit of a flirtation with the main character's daughter, Conchetta, who of course is his nephew's first cousin. But back in those days, cousins married all the time, and especially within these elite families. Well, the nephew ends up meeting another woman. This is the woman of a mayor of a town where this elite and noble family have a summer house. There is this underlying theme in the story that even though the mayor's daughter has a huge dowry that she can offer the main character's nephew, it's almost like her father is, and I quote, pimping his daughter out to the aristocrats, that even though potentially they are worth more than the aristocrats, their power is still limited because they are not a lineage family. We see this theme still today. We know that there are elite bloodline families and we see people perhaps in Hollywood and other walks of life that will do anything to be associated with this group of people. There are obviously a lot of underlying themes in this story that perhaps Giuseppe Tomasi was trying to tell us. Giuseppe Tomasi himself allegedly had a very weird relationship with his mother, which we see is common among this group of people, again, allegedly. And there is one thing that's for certain. The leopard is an elite animal. It hunts its prey. It watches and pounces when it has to. And another thing that's very certain about a leopard is that it never changes its spots. All right, so this is part one of a new series called The Devil's Family. Next week, we will get into part two. Again, this story opened up a new rabbit hole for me to go down. If there's anything you want to add to this story, please do down in the comment section below. Give me your thoughts and your opinions. As always, please remember to be respectful of everybody in the comment section. And please remember if there are any members of the Tomasi family still alive, do not harass them. In my opinion, everybody is really innocent until proven guilty. And just because somebody is born into a questionable family does not mean that that person him or herself is a questionable person. Again, our soul and the choices that we make are separate from our bloodline. 
All right, guys, I hope that you have a wonderful weekend ahead of you. Happy birthday to my boyfriend, Todd Roderick. Today is his birthday. So if you follow the Flying Mystics, make sure to give him a special happy birthday as well. As always, special thanks to Josh McKay for doing our opening music. If you would like to purchase the opening song, the full song, there is also a link down in the description box below. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.